Thank you so much, Helen, for opening this window into the future. We will have some time for questions and answers at the end of this session. But I would like to uh, jump into the panel discussion because if we now kind of looked into a little bit into the future and it's fascinating how you make it actually almost like the logical consequence, public sector, you know, and also uh, so we will see obviously more uh, sharing uh, economy models in health. Uh, it's you know, and that's something that is very important for us researchers to consider. What do we not kind of see now, but tomorrow? And keep that in mind. Organizational forms, digital cooperatives, fascinating. We'll come back also to the, the topic of uh, cities, and, and we have an expert here. But let me first kind of go back to reality and today. We have spent all morning about talking about organize, uh, organizations within the sharing economy. But I think it's time to actually talk to one that actually does this. So I'm really excited to have Benedict uh, Franke here with us. Uh, Helpling, most of you know Helpling, so I use Helpling if my mother-in-law is calling. She's coming tomorrow, so I call. Very good, you know, very I, good example. I, I use their app, go to their platform, and basically book a cleaning service. I also could obviously book it for kind of every two weeks. Um, Benedict, these, these rounds, these panels are not new for you. How is helping uh, position itself in this, in this really broad kind of um, umbrella term kind of, uh, of that we, you know, sharing economy, we convene, con converse to the collaborative economy. How do you position yourself uh, within uh, this either sharing or collaborative economy? So I think this is a very healthy question because we have seen before how complex this entire system is and how difficult it is to set categories. And I think that that's really like a scientific task to do that. Um, if we start out maybe by telling um, you about two ways how we are not part of the sharing economy or the on-demand economy. Um, the sharing economy you, uh, usually entails that you have a, a good that you can divide. Yeah? We are working... Um, for service providers, and you can hardly divide them. So, like how this is sharing, this is very hard to bring together. On the other hand, if you look at another definition or another term for what we do, is often on-demand economy, where on-demand usually um, tries to solve a need or an, uh, a use case that pops up and requires immediate satisfaction of a need. Yeah, so. We are more focused on long-term relationships, on a problem that is not popping up one second and the next day you don't have that need anymore, but we are very much focused on creating long-term relationships between people who are looking for a service provider and people who are service providers. So in these aspects, we are fairly different, although we would not fall into these definitions, but I think the common denominator here is, and this is, has come up before as well, is uh, very much that we use technology to allocate resources in a, uh, resources in a much more efficient way. Um, in our case, for example, by having the agendas of the people who try to find customers through our service, we can um, find customers that exactly fit their schedule and give them customers that are on the same route. So we can use their resources better using technology. Right? So um, we can do that. Usually you could do that with a good Excel file or maybe with a piece of paper. Um, but we can we can apply technology to do that on a large scale and basically do this without any transactional cost. So there we have a very common denominator. Uh, denominator. And the second aspect would be that we have this aspect, uh, this aspect of curating a marketplace. So you would um, today, for example, um, not only use helping to find someone for Friday morning 8 to 11, but you also would use it because like, instead of going through a week-long search through classifieds, where you would actually in Germany in 90% of the cases end up with a black market uh, service provider, we can break this process down to a three steps uh, booking that takes you 60 seconds and you have someone who is like, not performing the service in the black market, who is um, insured, and you can even call customer service if something goes wrong. Right? So in terms of technology and um, this curation of a marketplace aspect, I would think that are really the common denominators. 
Thank you, Benedict. And you see how, why talking and, and doing interviews, even if it's explorative na of nature, with organization in the sharing economy is so useful for me. I already picked up three new indicators for our business model. So this is exactly what we are uh, trying to do now. Now, the idea, or what we would how we would call it in our research, the value proposition of helpling is not new. It's not that it fall f did fa uh, fall from the sky. Uh, the, the question for me is that, or the question for me to you is, uh, how did you adapt the model in Germany? And knowing you, your ambitious, how are, what are the relevant factors that you have to consider scaling your model within Germany, but also uh, within Europe? So it's basically a question about the need for adaptation of the models. So um, like what we have in common also with most um, other share economy on, on demand economy platforms that we are replicating a marketplace. So a marketplace always has two sides to it, a demand side and a supply side. And you try to figure out a way of how they can get together. This can, in our case, it's a very local service, so you would not ask for, living in Berlin, ask for a service provider from Hamburg yeah, um, to come to visit you in Berlin. So we, we have this very, very local aspect to it that we need to match local demand and, and local supply. Um, so we have to rebuild this local supply and local demand, this liquidity in the marketplace on a per city basis, which is crucial if you want to scale it up. Some things are like pay off on a national scale or even an international scale. So I'm very happy that hopefully many people here have heard about helping. Um, and uh, I hope that we would be in a, situ a similar situation if we had this panel in, in, in Paris or in, in, in France. For example, we do national TV advertising in Germany. So some things you can um, pay off on the entire organization. Some things are very, very local. If you want to... Um, break it down to an easy easy like tip is like you need to look at how can you create value for both of the sites in the marketplace uh, for supply and demand um, in a specific given marketplace so if we would have berlin prices in munich munich customers households would be very very happy but we would not get a single cleaner on the platform yeah so there are these value drivers for both sides of the marketplaces that you need to adapt. And if you don't create value for them, then like, you can light a, a fire or something, uh, create a hype about, around something, but it's not sustainable. So you need to think about how can you create like, long-term value for everyone uh, involved. Just kind of sticking to the idea of, of value, you already, in, in answering the first question, you alluded to the fact that you create, in a way, public value as you bring a lot of people into formality and, and uh, you know, because you have the, the uh, secure, uh, social security aspect in your offering. How do you measure success and how are you, uh, is the public assessing your success? So, um, I think success and the criteria to uh, um, to to evaluate success changes over time. So I have to say that we are now, I think, 20 months in business, yeah, from sitting down on the desk um, till today, and we launched the platform in April 2015. So obviously, we have learned over time on which are the best factors, where in the beginning, New customers, for example, is a very important metric for us, just for example, to understand are people willing to try the service out? Yeah. So is there, uh, was it just two to guys who think, okay, people should book uh, cleaning online and this is completely far off from reality. Um, if you have people starting to register as cleaners to go through the process, um, if you have people who try booking the service, yeah, this is a good first indicator that you're not completely off reality. At the same time, for us today now, yes, we still look at the new customer and new cleaner um, development on our platform, but most important metric for us at the moment and this, like, for the imaginable future will be how long do people stick to the platform? Yeah? Do we have not only like a first moment value perceived, but does that value play out in a, or gets confirmed by the, by the reality by people sticking to the service? So do the households not only 
want to find someone and then work around the platform um, or do the um, service provider see this after like they do this for six months um, do they continue using the platform to find new customers and manage their their, their customers etc and this is the most important metric for, for us so if you like our KPI is so average numbers of accumulated jobs per customer per year for example uh, or six month retention so if I have after six months only 10% of the customers that we brought onto the platform um, uh, on day one then I don't have a business yeah so if I have 50 fantastic and is that also the expectations from the public is or are you also exposed are you exposed to expectation in terms of value created that you demonstrate is that we talked about sociability, for example. Now, your model is not necessarily the first one that comes to mind when I think about direct sociability. Or, but mm -hmm. do you feel there are pressures? Here, I'm talking about more public societal mm -hmm. yeah. legitimacy uh, uh, concerns that you're faced with. And I think this is the absolute. Uh, it is absolutely legitimate to uh, to discuss these things because um, I don't think that there is a contradiction in the first place. Um, so if you do the, if you take a, if your goal is to be in the market not for a year or something, but for a long term, then you need to have a positive impact on everyone involved. This is uh, like f our, um, not only our investors, but also the people who work for our company. It's the customers and it's the service provider and it's the, the government. And um, if you that's why I think it's so important to discuss the principle of sharing economy or the on-demand economy, um, not per se, but uh, like break it down like you did. So let's look at the actual company and the market environment and what it looks like today and w how our business model impacts it. If we look at our market, for example, um, it's not only the, in Germany the case, but in Germany, 90% of the home cleaning market is the black market. Yeah, so nine out of ten people who clean homes are doing this illegally yeah, in the black market. Um, there's no social security in this market, so we are taking this very, very like unorganized and, and, and dysfunctional market and we bring more structure to it and we allow also a discussion about it well, because like, we are happy to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, and um, within the framework that we have, um, we try to get the best outcome for everyone involved and we do that out of like we would already do that out of pure self-interest because um, if one of these three sides falls off the, the, the cliff then you do not have a sustainable business for example if the for us one of our biggest tasks that we are thinking about every day is how can we make our offering to the service providers more competitive to the black market. Yeah, because that's the, the big competition here. Better alternative. Yeah, exactly. So what, what triggers them? And um, the, we can talk about uh, how health insurance is discriminatory if you're working as a self-employed. Um, uh, there, um, uh, um, there are certain uh, thresholds to becoming self-employed, bureaucracy, for example. So we can work within this framework and we think that we, we have a positive impact for everyone involved. Yeah? Um, and if we don't have that positive impact, then we will not be successful. Mm -hmm. Your talk was fascinating because you really reminded us of some of our assumptions that we take. But also that allows us really to think about the consequences and especially the unintended consequences. And I think this is just kind of following nicely on Benedict's remark. Um, at the same time, Nesta is, is doing a lot of work with governments, with different stakeholders, uh, doing a lot of research. Where do we stand in terms of moving from you know, imagining uh, in intent, unintended intended consequences towards actually assessing uh, impact or really kind of come towards meaningful ways of, of assessing impact in all these kind of, um, you know, mess in terms of terminology or so. Do you see, uh, or where are pockets of, 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 of hope in order to get this right? Because we can, you know, we can get this completely wrong. Uh, uh, there's more. 
Is this on? Yes. Uh, so there's more than pockets of hope, I think. There's um, deep reserves of hope. And I hope I didn't paint a bleak picture, actually. It's a very positive picture, but it's, it's complex. And there are some deeply sort of challenging questions that result from it. The kind of lack of research generally is a big problem. I think you talked about this this morning, haven't you, Peter? And the research library will do some for that. But the biggest challenge, really, I think, um, is twofold. One is that... Um, uh, innovation outpaces research. So the, by the point at which you have conducted a research study in such a fluid environment, you'll probably find that things have moved on. And so the, not just sort of really trying to future, future think what models are, but also have a, a sense of responsibility out ha as much as researchers want to do this, have a, to sh what they want to shape, to how to be a bit value driven. In terms of how to address that, I think um, the more researchers and the more um, public policy people conduct real live on the ground trials and experiments, I think, in places with cities, in partnership with sharing economy platforms and communities and local businesses, the better. Because you're looking at really crunchy real life data from which you can make quite quick decisions if you want to. And if there's the sense that to coordinate that together across different places, you start <coughs> building a really interesting picture. I. I fully applaud and don't have objections to people who want to kind of spend a lot of time defining what it is, but my, my practical nature takes me into a, well, let's just roll our sleeves up and see what's really happening. The, the idea of uh, sociability that we also just uh, discussed, uh, is that something that you see already kind of factored in in the way we assess impact? Quite frankly, what do we know? Uh, at the moment, like the, the, the biggest thing for, for policymakers to be excited about it is if we tell them this is, uh, this is creating so and so and so uh, a number of jobs. The biggest excitement for investors is this is a market opportunity, so and so. So basically, we are at the level of content potentialities. And this morning we also talked about uh, a potential analysis and potentiality potentialities. How can we move beyond that? And really, and this is something that we are literally grappling, no? If we report back to, to Mr. Wilhelm, what are we going to report back? What's really the, the, the beitrag, the contribution of the sharing economy in Germany to the economy? Can we go, you know, what are interesting markers here that would allow us to, you know, first be creative, but also pick, pick the reality uh, from the sharing uh, organizations and, and come up with meaningful indicators, markers of success of, let's say, uh, a, a new type of economy. Anything that comes to mind. And now I'm obviously asking like her to, it's not an easy to make to sure that. that we don't go on the wrong path. Uh, Peter will have um, some good answers to that or some good thoughts about that as well. But I mean, I think the biggest thing is to, um, is to always be thinking across your triple bottom line. So it's got to be economic, social, environmental. And the environmental tends to sort of get washed away slightly, but uh, it doesn't need to be. It's not co actually as complicated as social, in my view, in some ways. But um, in, t in terms of understanding social value, uh, if you try to pick off the sharing economy as a whole, you will, that's not going to happen. You know, it's sort of, what is this marketplace doing in this neighborhood or community and how is it affecting people's lives of which there are very clear or will be some very clear indicators it just may not be the same indicators as a different sharing economy in a different thing so the question of aggregating social impact is um that's all i'm going to say it would be incredibly complicated to yeah. do that no i completely <laughs> agree and obviously i was pushing you and we heard this morning also is one marker of success how how much these routines are actually embedded or entrenched in the daily routines. Would that be seen as a marker of success? Of course, markers of success are really also depends on us of what we see as, as success. But this is really a great moment to actually uh, go back to Peter. And for those of you who have not met Peter this morning, he's the co-founder of uh, Sharing, uh, the Sharing Netherlands. But he's also he has also taken on the, the ambitious plan to turn Amsterdam into a sharing city. Very different approach from the one that you have seen on 
the slides uh, that um, Helen showed, uh, the case of uh, Seoul, where it was very much a top-down approach, very much kind of um, pushed by the mayor. Um, in your case, it was originally an idea that the city really wanted, and then political processes, lack of interest, and here you come, Peter, you step in and say, I will do it in a, in a different way, in a more bottom-up, uh, uh, you know, participatory mode, uh, and you already got this question this morning, so where do we see initiatives uh, bubbling up here on, on a sharing city that is not following a, a top-down but a bottom-up approach? Yeah, I think one of the examples that has been uh, starting up this year in Amsterdam uh, is the one with the public library. And uh, I've said before, of course, share, Amsterdam Sharing City is a platform and we do not dictate, but we do make people aware that it's good to do things uh, that deal with problems that keeps our mayor awake at night. And one of the things is indeed older people. Uh, and people who do not have that, mu that, much, uh, that much access to, to the internet. Uh, so uh, with the public library and their uh, what they call iPad classes for the elderly in Amsterdam, they are now also in the iPad class are learning about some sharing economy apps. And uh, you see that some of the uh, startups that are active within Amsterdam uh, are themselves now looking for ways to reach out to these new consumer groups. Uh, one of them, again, is Share Your Meal, which, of which I spoke about this morning. And what they do is they've got uh, they build up a, a network of volunteers that are basically connecting their home cooks uh, with uh, older isolated citizens. And we have a lot of isolated older citizens in, in Amsterdam. And um, this is basically a project where they work to, uh, together with the government because they are replacing uh, a public function. Uh, you have like a, a very 20th century, uh, very hierarchically, hierarchically organized institution to provide meals for these people. And they are not so tasty. They come from a box, you put them in a microwave. So now it's a home cook, someone from within the neighborhood that comes and brings what, it, what he's been cooking or a volunteer that's bringing the food. So that's also, I think, uh, just uh, another example. And again, the beautiful thing is that we just want a better city and these things emerge without us telling anyone to do these things. And I think that's the beauty of, of the approach that we have. And to come back to the city, uh, there was a policy win of opportunity after I uh, had the opportunity to present my own research findings on the consumer potential in Amsterdam. And I was in front of a room full of policy makers, so I basically hacked my presentation and I only spoke for two or three minutes about my research. And then I spoke about Seoul, which was a sharing city and everything we could do in Amsterdam. And that kick-started, that, that created awareness and attention within Amsterdam. Um, another thing was that Airbnb had been talking with Amsterdam for a long time and they had been proactive and working together. So there was another kind of force. And then we decided to write a position paper on the opportunity for Amsterdam. Uh, then it was almost adopted by the city government as well. Then there were elections last year. And since then, there's been a long <coughs> process for official adoption uh, from within the city government. But uh, at the end of last year, we decided we're just going to launch anyway. So we launched in February and invited the deputy mayor who came and was very enthusiastic and said some beautiful things about that Amsterdam should be a sharing city. And the quotes from this deputy mayor are now helping uh, to finally, this month and otherwise it will be ultimately in the spring of 2016, the city government itself will come up with what they're going to do, being part of a broad coalition of ambassadors working on Amsterdam sharing city. And Within what the city is going to do are things like sharing what the city is owning, inf investigating what island capacity they have. Uh, and they're like, um, you know, like s sort of neighborhood managers from the city. And there's like a, a city uh, pass that every citizen is going to get in the future, uh, uh, which brings you to Muzia and these kind of things. But they want to integrate sharing economy services in the city pass that everyone's going to get. So they're, they're going to do quite a lot more. So. Yeah, it's bottom up, but in the end, we do want, of course, the, the government to be a part of it, but not the dictating part. And I think that is also uh, one of the appeals, or at least uh, a big part of the discussion about cities as um, getting engaged in, in the sharing economy as an alternative owner, so to say. So basically, if, if there is the city public sector owning the platform, uh, that is, of course, like uh, has advantages and disadvantages. We talked about the conditions of success of, of, of sh uh, sharing 
engineering models and you know critical mass is certainly one. Uh, and uh, your example also speaks a little bit kind of to to the, um, the the things that we have to keep in mind: political processes uh, creating holdups, right? And we I know I'm saying this because we do have participants here that uh, that try to kind of do more on sharing cities in their own cities, Vienna and Berlin. They're all here uh, from an expert who is basically following a, a different ownership model, <laughs> uh, you know, venture capitalist, private ownership. What are your thoughts from the outside to uh, to uh, to cities share uh, uh, owning the platforms? What do what would be your recommend uh, can recommendation? Be careful about this and that. Um, so I would always say if someone privately does it, then you as a government you should not crowd them out. Yeah, so I have a very strong opinion about that. Usually, in our case, we had exactly that situation last year when um, the the government um, like reinforced its effort about an online platform where you could find suppliers. Yeah, and um, uh, I think we checked it two, three weeks ago. There are not even ten people that registered there for Berlin. Yeah, so I don't think that the government per se is. Um, should provide these platforms or should install these platforms. Um, I think there it's more about talking to the players in this industry um, and finding out of how can you facilitate by regulation and also very clearly um, stating the, um, the, the conditions under which you would be willing as a government to, to mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. not that we are alone in the world so we um, we have to justify um, the outcome of our acts. Mm -hmm. yeah? So mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in a scenario where um, you as a government you can try to shape a certain development, but I think at the same time um, it's also very important to like give some space to have a certain develop because the development is exactly that. It's, it's, it's happening so fast. So if we look at, at our, uh, our company um, compared to to a year ago, how fast we have developed, how much we have learned in the meantime, and we are like I can just say that for happening, we are not done with our model. So mm -hmm. this is the way we do. I can guarantee everyone in, if we talk in ten years, happening will be different than it is today. Yeah, this is 100% guaranteed. Um, so there is an evolution, and I think this evolution always happens much faster, and only happens fast enough if you give space to the to the the, the actors. Like um, I think we have very open ears in the political environment, um, also because I think we can we are credible in uh, in our ambition to. Like um, not go berserk, mm -hmm. yeah, and also what plays very much in our favor that we are in a market that doesn't work today. Yeah, so it's a it's a, a, a completely dysfunctional market today. Um, you have a different discussion in Germany, for example, about Uber. Yeah, when Uber s came to Germany, um, not showing a lot of will to to discuss regulation, for example. Um, if I think for a German government, it's per se very difficult. Um, but at the same time, um, they acted in a market that was like very monopolistic, <laughs> overregulated. You can think of it what you what you want, but it was regulated. It was there, and it had standards. So if you completely um, avoid any any discussion or responsibility about what what's happening, um, then you have a different standpoint. So what we see is that people are interested in talking to us and getting our feedback, our input, and um, I think a lot of the issues that we would discuss in terms of potential negative social impact, um, these are not necessarily problems that are only tied to our platforms or our businesses, but that are social, for example, the problems of people with low incomes. Yeah, that's not in, uh, if you look at our industry, this is a low paying industry. Yeah, so the problems that you usually have in low-income um, uh, parts of the society, like they become very manifest in, in our um, uh, in our business uh, model and in our um, business environment. So by not by detaching those issues a bit and talking very openly about uh, potential ways to improve, I think that's the that's the first step. Yeah.
Thank you, and this is exactly what we hope to do with all our uh, research to pro provide more evidence for a more informed debate. And the Hertie School stands for this, this interaction between the different sectors, the public, the private, and the, and the social. And we very much hope with our research uh, project that we can also live up to that expectation and really kind of have a, a clearer picture in five years where, where this is actually ended up going. Uh, I really want to thank the three of you. It just added uh, a lot of new nuances uh, to our understanding, but hopefully also to yours.